Introducing the notion of barriers or things that are in the way. She mentioned, I think, both resources and lack of precedent, somewhat prejudice for the others, and then we can come back, Kathy, as well, if you'd like. What are the barriers? What are the things that st have stood in your way as you move forward in your, in your jurisdictions and in your various programs? Well, for those of you that may be familiar with councils of government in other states, one of the things that's a problem is that our transportation planning in North Carolina and South Carolina is done separately from our land use planning. So in the Midwest and, and Northeast, other parts of the country, an, an MPO, a metropolitan planning organization, has regional planning and also has regional transportation. When they're done separately, it, it's, a, it's a huge barrier. And the land, the land use transportation connection, you hear about at all levels creating problems for active living. I don't know if this is a barrier so much as it's just part of the process, but really changing that conversation, particularly now that I'm, I'm in the, the world of public health, from the clinic setting where many of our workforce have been trained, that's what they went to school for, and helping them to understand that, yes, we provide exceptional clinical services. We have over a million patient encounters a year, but we've also given them an opportunity to be part of this prevention work. And some of that started before I came to the department, but our commissioner, I really have to tip my hat to him as an exceptional leader because he's helped to move that conversation from how do you go from health care to upstream primary prevention. And there's a role that we can all play, no matter if we're a clinician or we work as a lawyer or whatever our role is, particularly in public health, there's something that we can do to be a part of the solution. Kathy, anything else you want to I, mention? I would just say one thing in rural communities is that rural communities are losing population, they're losing jobs, they're losing a lot. And so when we say you should have all these policies around development, you should put this in, you should make your developers do this, they say we are just dying for anything to come in here. And so for us to put up those barriers for developers, they just feel like that's not what they want to do. But what they, you know, are, what, what is so important is that they don't do that much, so what they do do should be really adding to the community and adding to the value. And so we've had that conversation and it's really, it's a tough one, but I think they're really coming around and they're learning from each other. And that's, if I say they should have these policies, it's one thing, but if another community says, we have this policy and we stick to it, then they're like, oh, you do? What's your policy? You know, like, oh. so. Cool. We have lots of time for questions. So there are two microphones, I believe, uh, one in the middle and one on this side. I'm, as you make your way here, let me ask one more question of the panel because I think there will be questions. Uh, I'm confident there will be, in fact. We will have a hard stop at noon, however. I, so the, the, the silos at the end uh, was a great visual. Uh, and I think everyone here uh, is now uh, comfortable saying that we have to collaborate. We have to work together. Found, uh, funders now insist on collaboration. This notion of collaboration is uh, is, is, is in every aspect from funding to delivery of services. And yet, when you look, as Gary Stangler, my friend long ago said, if you look at the definition of collaboration, the second definition is giving aid and comfort to the enemy. And so as much as we talk about collaboration, it truthfully is not an easy thing to do. What have you found most successful in bringing collaboration in addition, or even you, you're welcome to repeat those things that you brought forward in your, in your presentations? Uh, we found the, uh, an, an interesting strategy is to do it kind of undercover, uh, under the cover of training. Um, our engineers and planners and public health officials uh, need to have credited hours uh, to keep up their professional certifications. And so we bring people together, but oh wow, they just might learn something. Um, so we start with that, um, but then we find that everybody's speaking the same language. Uh, they really want the same things. I agree. We've found that our partners may define success and need differently. They may or may not use the words equity or social determinants, but they have ways of prioritizing deficits across the state, and they end up being the same places that we want to work in as well. And I think a large part of that is just understanding their framework, their decision-making processes, their politics, if you will, and then, again, focusing on not what's new and an and, and added to do, but where can we collaborate where we're already working and how can we combine resources. 
We've seen a really interesting trend in our state where our departments of transportation, our state parks, our department of economic community development, they all are now requiring health data to be eligible for one of their grants. And one of the outcomes has to be that you're illustrating how their dollars are going to impact health in the community. Wow. This is not something that we saw several years ago. And we're, in fact, helping them to review a lot of those grants and to come up with metrics for those grants. So I, I see a big interest now in cross-sector collaboration. Yeah, I would echo that. Um, I, I would say that one of the things we need to do a better job of is not telling our, our partners, you need to do this because of health. You know, this, mm -hmm. this is a good thing because of health. Um, I, I, we need to understand what their priorities are and talk about their priorities. And, uh, and I think that's how we build relationships and uh, not have people thinking that they're just doing something for us, which, mm -hmm. you know, we need to define it differently um, through their lens. Good, we have 20 minutes for questions. Paul. Hi there, thank you so much for the presentations and it's really inspiring to see the impact and the improvement that's taking place. I wanna build off of, I have two questions. One builds off of the collaboration uh, comment that you had, Bill, which is, is the, is the businesses involved, the private sector involved in these collaborations? And if they are, how do they help or do they help in the process? And then the other question is, with all the work being done in the cities and communities, it's all local, What's the secret sauce? Is there a secret sauce? Is it the mayor that needs to get involved and be the, the grand stander to get the action? Or is there another person or individual? Or does it vary by community? I would say in our experience, it, it is the mayor. Um, it is the mayor and those key elected officials, I mean, maybe the chair of the county board. But it's, it's the chair and the mayor getting it and then inviting the private sector in. And it has to be personal. It can't be an email from a planner. Uh, it has to be from the top, inviting in, and that seems to work for us. And as far as the private sectors, um, you know, how they've add, you know, added to the conversation, it's really critical for the, the elected officials definitely want that. They want the private sector to be in. And when the private sector speaks, everybody listens. Um, our board is made up of elected officials, so we're always thinking about the messaging towards them. And even if we need to talk about healthy communities from an economic development standpoint, then that's what we'll do. Just like you were saying, it's fine. It's economic development, whatever you want to call it. It's <laughs> we're, we're all doing the same thing. The private sector, to me, is the silver bullet that we're looking for. Many of us from the government and the nonprofit sectors have been doing this work for so long, but it's trying to frame this. Even if you talk about worksite wellness, I don't think we're quite there yet as a nation where the cost of health care for our employees is, is enough that we're really taking notice. And I always thought employers would be interested in things like complete streets so that their employees were arriving to work sooner and were fresher and ready to go, or were out less taking care of sick children, that kind of thing. But we haven't yet landed on how to engage the private sector, but I think it's so important, not because of the, the financial resources, but just how the private sector is able to make that case. Interestingly, just yesterday in Nashville, there was an announcement that Google was looking for a second US headquarters and was thinking about Nashville, but was declining because Nashville doesn't have as robust of a mass transit system as they would like to see. Thank you, Paul. Question here. Uh, yes, Jana Linet with AARP's Public Policy Institute. Excellent presentations, all of you. Thank you. Um, my question is, I read more and more about the importance of social engagement and how loneliness can actually have a bigger long-term health uh, effect on people than even obesity. So I'm, I'm just wondering if you have any examples from your communities where either as just an outcome, it's helping the community become more socially engaged, people more with one another, or if you're measuring that, those types of indicators in any way. Um, just looking for great case studies, so thank you. We haven't measured it, but I would say the Open Streets uh, project is really something that any community can do. Uh, just block off the street. And it's neighbors meeting neighbors. It's really not about you know, transportation or recreation. It's really about community. And that's the way that we've been billing uh, that one day. And so it gets, gets people out. Uh, it's nice. 
We also have some creative aiding grants that we've been partnering with our Arts Commission on. And, and Arts is such a wonderful partner. They do so much work around placemaking, which absolutely contributes to healthy, thriving communities. So we just issued those grants with our Department of Aging and Disability as well as the Arts Commission. So we'll let you know how those go. Okay. Question here. Yes, hi, Daniel Rodriguez, UC Berkeley. Uh, thank you for this great uh, presentation, terrific leadership. I wanted to uh, piggyback on the private sector question. It was also in my mind. Uh, maybe ask more pointedly whether you've involved in any of your activities, either chambers of commerce or, uh, and hospitals uh, through different ways. If you have examples of how that you've involved them in your work, I'd love to hear that. Thanks. Leslie. Well, if I can toot Mayor Purcell's horn for a moment, he was very instrumental in our region in bringing the, our Nashville Chamber to a national chamber event a few years ago to really think about the chamber's involvement in health care. And that spurred a couple of studies in our region looking at access to health care and concluding that while we have great access to health care and pretty high utilization, that of course we don't have the health rates that we would like to see. We still have high rates of COPD and depression and, and all of the things we're talking about today. And so the, the wonderful thing about that is our chamber is now actively involved in this as a, a partner, and they want to figure out how they can better be a leader and a champion in this work and how they can engage with companies who are moving into our region to help them be a part of the solution. So thanks to Mayor Purcell for that. Well, the, the chamber, in fact, Ralph Schultz from our chamber spoke uh, within the last year here at the round table. And, and brought, that, brought that message home. It, it, they, they, they did a calculation this year of the cost, <clears throat> excuse me, the cost of poor health outcomes to, to, to the city on an annual basis, and including presenteeism and absenteeism, it's over $500 million a year in cost to the, to the business and the, and the economy of, of Nashville. And that, that gets the, the attention of a chamber and feeds right back to everything that's been advocated here and on your panel so well just before. <coughs> Um, Please. I just thought I'd say in one of our, large, our largest city, Billings, which is only 100,000 people, uh, the chamber is incredibly engaged. And in fact, they rebranded the city trailhead to the um, Montana trailhead. And the, the chamber has like 100 people on their trails committee to make sure that the community is connected through trails. They, they see it as a real economic development strategy. One, one thing, please. Um, well, please. Our chambers are most involved in, in light rail. So when we have our discussions around transit stops and new transit lines, um, they're very interested because we've done studies to look at the property values. Uh, we, look, we look at value per acre around the transit stops versus other places, and those obviously are, are a lot higher. Um, and so they're very interested in that. Um, also, Charlotte, unfortunately, was ranked the, the lowest in a upward social mobility study recently. And the chamber has really, um, really started to, to think about that and think about what that does for the business, not only growth, um, but retention um, in the future. So they're, they're becoming a lot more involved. So I'd like to ask the question on political leadership. You mentioned that it's imperative for the mayors or a political leader to take control of this issue or at least stimulate the issue in a community. And we know that Oftentimes, the political leadership is on a short-term basis, and they, these issues, as was referenced earlier, are long-term um, process issues. So how do we bridge that gap from the short-term political gain to the long-term collaboration that is needed? It, it, is a tough, it is a tough thing. There is turnover. Um, if you can look for political leaders that you think will be there, uh, longer than one term, uh, that's always good. Um, work with your councils of government because um, a lot of times even after someone rotates off of their elected leadership, they will still take a leadership role um, in the community in some way. And we've had you know, ex, ex officio uh, leaders that, you know, former mayors, former chairs, and that's okay. Um, their personalities are such that people listen to them. Um, so. Uh, we kind of use it that way. Another thing to think about is for elected leadership, it's, it's their second, third, or fourth job to, to incorporate into any type of process. Um, and so allaying their fears early 
about any missteps that they might make is important. Um, we took the time to do several calls to other regions to find out what did you learn when you were starting this work and the elected officials could talk to one another one-on-one -on -one. and I feel like that really helped uh, set a base of understanding and also help them uh, be confident as we move forward. It's absolutely true that leaders come and go. It's also true every once in a while there's a bad leader. It, it happens. <laughs> Uh, and the, at the local level and the state level and at every level. It, 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 it can happen. Uh, but if during the time when you had the attention of the community, if that moment in time when you had everyone focused together, as I think you, you hear from these places now, if at that time you make the case in the community, if they can see it and feel it and touch it, and I think we saw it in small places in Montana here today and in Charlotte, which is obviously a growing and thriving place, as is Nashville and, and many other places represented here. At that moment, what happens actually is that people want it. They're insistent upon it. They, they require it and they call for it. So even though the leader or the particular leader of that segment may not be focused or headed that way, turns out the other leaders will do their best to deliver that thing that people wanted. Or if the state's not taking care of it, the local government will step up. The federal government sometimes steps into vacuums when the others aren't there. It has been that way, but people, it's, a, it's, a, it's that great secret that fifth grade delivered and sometimes we lose sight of. If people really, really, really want something, at the end of the day, the elected officials will do their best to deliver it. You have to really, really, really want it. It's just not good enough just to want it or to ask for it. But if you really want it, if you really want a connected city that provides those opportunities and a quality of life that gives meaning and value not just to your life, but to the life of your children and your grandchildren, if you want that badly enough, they're going to do everything they can to give it to you over time, whoever might stand in the way. We had an interesting experience with the $10,000 grants that I mentioned that we gave to 89 of our 95 counties. Our health departments walked into their elected officials' offices and said, we, we've got this money. And what we found were the elected officials were so excited, they had to prioritize what they were going to spend and to come up with a project or two. And that money had to be spent in six months. And so a lot of communities chose really quick wins, a walking track at a school or a new playground at a park. And so they built something very tangible. Most of them chose to build rather than to plan something. And the elected officials are getting all the credit for it, and they didn't have to put a drop of money into the bucket. The health department paid for everything. And so I think our elected officials, they, they have ideas. It's just helping to bring some of those resources to the table. And, I, and again, I think that goes with new administrations and old as well. Please. So I have a question that was actually prompted by the question about political um, leaders uh, and elected leaders and a conversation the other day with a colleague who uh, works on risk management with FEMA at a national level. So I was just wondering if any of your uh, built environment planning uh, touches on issues of climate change or disaster preparedness, emergency preparedness, et cetera. And, and, any examples of how that might be um, integrated with the kind of the chronic disease prevention and active living side. In Tennessee, we have the Tennessee Resilience Council, which formed just around that exact notion that in order for communities to have uh, long term, uh, the ability to, to be uh, resilient. Uh, to disaster, that you have to have that not only recovery and, and uh, that initial response, but that long-term ability to bounce back. And so the mission of that council is to really focus on livability and quality of life and to build some of this infrastructure into communities so that when they do have a disaster like a hurricane or a tornado, that they have that infrastructure built in to figure out how to bounce back. And that council works closely with our livability collaborative. So we feel like we have a, a burgeoning but nice efforts in our state. Other questions? Uh, oh, Governor, I wish you would, please. I wish you would. In fact, we'll get you a microphone. Please, just grab a lavalier. Uh, for the last uh, panel, but I, I thought the the question and, and the response about uh, really, really wanting it um, 
going beyond elected officials tenure and all becomes very, very crucial. Uh, you get a lot of elected officials uh, doing very, very good things, but uh, uh, fortunately, they all move on at one point. Uh, and so how do you create something like that? And I'll make a couple of quick observations. One in our, our small state, and I'm always awed by the Montana statistics, and I know a number of friends there because our state is a tiny little state, uh, a little bit bigger than our neighbor Delaware, but that's about all. Uh, but uh, uh, our, our state, one of the things that happened over the years is the governor, a number of years ago, uh, back in the early uh, 80s, uh, Governor Hughes uh, made a really focus on the Chesapeake Bay and our responsibility and the fact that we surround the bay on three sides. Uh, and it became part of the political ethos uh, of politics uh, in Maryland. And no one runs for office or does anything uh, without uh, pledging allegiance to the bay efforts. Now, in some cases, they don't do as well and they're not really interested, uh, but, but they, they do stick with that very uh, tightly. The second one we did uh, was, in my case, when we started uh, Smart Growth, and we made that a key signature of what public policy in uh, Maryland was going to be. Uh, we're not going to support sprawl. We're going to support reinvestment in existing communities. Even though a couple of governors subsequently have not been as enthusiastic in terms about actually implementing it, the one thing that is very, very clear uh, is no one runs against it. Uh, and they do it in different ways and all, but it's still there. Now, we're seeing the same thing uh, nationwide uh, in a big way with the shift toward public and business support for transit and transit-oriented development. Uh, it's pretty phenomenal what has happened in the last decade uh, with uh, almost 80 percent of the referenda that involve tax increases uh, for support of mass transit have been approved. Uh, and the most interesting thing, at least from my perspective, is that many of these approvals are not in the backyard of the usual suspects. This is not just the Northeast and liberal communities and all, but it's uh, like uh, Tennessee, uh, and it's like North Carolina. Uh, and so we're seeing this. Uh, you don't build a light rail system under any one mayor or even governor. And so what has to happen is the ownership and the business community and others have to really be there. And that, that is exciting. Uh, now, one uh, quick other observation and I'll ask a question as well. The, the question I think is, is really strong in, in my mind is how do you link, and, and we're trying to do this formally through Smart Growth America, how do you link an evaluation of expenditures and policies and what you're doing, the different uh, uh, silos that are public policy? And so how do you get someone automatically that's doing a transportation policy to think, well, gee, what's the impact on health? Or someone who's doing a health policy, what's the impact on the business community or education community? And breaking that down becomes so important. We have seen, and this is true for so many uh, groups, that one of the key parts is making the business case for this project. And what we have basically shown is that where the millennials want to work and uh, the best business development now, in fact, is having a place, a walkable community that is often transit oriented. And you all know this in terms of your perspective. So I think that that is a key part of it. I think the big question, though, and I would leave this with you all because you're uniquely forward for this. If you look at the map, one of the things that is very clear is that in the Southeast, we are having the least success in all of these projects. And when you overlay things like sprawl and obesity, or, or uh, sprawl and automobile and air quality and respiratory illnesses, the, it's the, the impact is stunning. Now, um, North Carolina and Tennessee are doing some very interesting things, and you're right on the edge of this. But we have not been able to penetrate uh, the, the deep portion of the southeast. And this is the fastest growing part of the country. So part of the question, I guess, from your experiences, what would you say that we should take to not just the elected officials, uh, but to the public? Because I think this is going to have to perk up and not be pushed down in these states. I, I thought it was interesting, by the way, to see the two state governors of the two states most impacted by the storms just recently and seeing how much federal assistance be needed and how terrible this was, are strong anti-climate change or climate deniers. Mm -hmm. uh, and so clearly, we need some efforts coming up. So with that long question, let me stop. So 
I'll take the example of, um, of transit, just because we know that transit helps bring people out of poverty, it provides access to upward mobility for jobs, gets people to medical services, I mean, the list goes on and on, uh, air quality, there's a lot of benefits. We are trying to think about m transit supportive messaging from all walks of life. So even for people who would never ride transit, why is it good to have transit in your community as part of your transportation system? What are the economic development interests in that? Uh, how is having transit good for the farmer who doesn't have to deal with the development pressures on his farm because the density stays closer to the transit? So we're trying to figure out how to message that from all points of life. Um, and I think that's, that's something that uh, could help us move us forward. I think, uh, Leslie, you did a nice job of explaining how our state of Tennessee, how our governor and the leadership has tried to include the other silos, and, and I think in Montana as well. You, you, you did a nice job there of presenting that issue uh, as well. We have time for the one final question. All right, one quick question. My name's Calvin Tribby. I'm a Cancer Prevention Fellow at the NCI. I'm curious how, I haven't heard Vision Zero policies talked about yet, so the idea behind these are to get to zero traffic-related fatalities in 15 to 20 years through built environment interventions, behavior interventions, policy enforcement, et cetera. So I'm wondering how those overlap with built environment modifications for obesity prevention. That's a great question. I know in our state, we have a lot of attention right now on Vision Zero. And actually, Smart Growth America just recently hosted a workshop for our state department of transportation so that we could enhance our complete streets policy, which we've had for a number of years. But it really needs to be at the state, the regional, and the local levels. And so that's where I think we're going to see some of our wins, is when you have those policies at all levels of government. But that's something that is absolutely on our radar. And I'm really glad you brought it up. Well, that uh, concludes this second panel. Let me remind you, we will reconvene here at 1 o'clock. For those of you who are having lunch here at the National Academies, there is a cafeteria just downstairs. I also want to remind you that you are to fill out some cards, that the cards need to be filled out uh, and provided to Jim Salas. You heard that description earlier. I want to mention that the Lincoln Memorial continues to be just across the street. It's been there a very long time. We expect it to be there a long time to come, but it's a very nice walk just across to the Lincoln Memorial and back. Do it twice if you feel inspired to do that. You have all of that available to you in the next hour. I want to ask you to join me in, in thanking the mountain of Montana, the next woman of the year in Tennessee, and the woman of the year in Charlotte-Mecklenburg County. <laughs>